You're listening to the Visualizing War podcast. In each episode, we talk about representations of war in art, text, film, and music. With new guests each time, we look at how people have described or imagined war in different periods and places. And we discuss the impact which war stories have on us as individuals and societies. Hello, my name is Alice Koenig. And my name is Nicolas Vieta. And we co-direct the Visualizing War project at the University of St. Andrews. Our guest today is actor, writer and director Jonathan Guy Lewis. Jonathan might be best known to listeners from his television work. He played Sergeant Chris McLeod in Soldier Soldier during the 1990s and also did stints in Holby City, London's Burning and Coronation Street. He always enjoyed acting at school but initially set out to have a career in the army, winning a prestigious army scholarship and getting a commission with the Coldstream Guards before injury led to him being invalided out at just 22. Johnny's time in the army has not only shaped some of his acting roles, it's also inspired some of his writing. So 1993 saw the premiere of his award-winning play, Our Boys, which focuses on a group of soldiers recovering from various injuries, including PTSD, in a military hospital. And more recently, he wrote the play Soldier On, which examines the journeys that military personnel take when they leave the army. Inspired by drama workshops that he's run with veterans, the play focuses on a group of soldiers who take up acting to help with their PTSD. And to come full circle, it's now performed by a mix of actors and veterans brought together by the Soldiers Arts Academy, where Johnny is artistic director. So Johnny, it's fantastic to have you on the podcast. Thanks very much for taking time to talk to us today. Thank you. Yes, hello. Lovely to be here. Johnny, can you start us off maybe by telling our listeners just a little bit about your army career and then how you moved from there into acting? Uh, of course, yeah. That was a very big build-up. I'm sitting there thinking, is that me? Gosh. I won an army scholarship when I was 15 uh, at school and really only because my parents were getting divorced and my my mum said, I can't afford your school fees anymore. You'll, you'll have to leave and, and, and go somewhere else. And I thought, well, I don't want to leave. It's just getting to the good bit. How do I stay? I randomly saw on the, uh, we had the CCF, the Combined Cadet Force notice board. And uh, I used to really enjoy that. Um, that's where you sort of dress up as soldiers and you run around with guns and making um, camps and uh, shouting at people. I saw on the notice board uh, an advert for army scholarships and that they paid your school fees and gave you a place at Sarandhurst and helped you finance you through university. And I thought, oh. That looks rather good. And my friend was going up for one. So I thought I'd tag along for the ride. I got all the way down to the final selection. And in the interviews at, at Sandhurst, obviously that's why I honed my acting skills because in the interviews, uh, what made me stick out, I don't know. Anyway, I won one of these things and it changed the course of my life, really. I went from, at school, I was Mr. Average. Didn't really stand out at anything other than the CCF and school plays. And then it turned me into uh, everyone would, you know, point and go, that's the guy who won the military, the army scholarship. So it did give me a sense of confidence um, to have won that. And then I went to university. I went to Exeter Uni and I studied politics and society. All the time I was involved in the student theatre and either writing, producing, directing or acting in something. And when I finished uni, uh, I uh, was embarking on on my military career. And I'd been to see lots of regiments and uh, I was very lucky to be asked to, to join the Coldstream as a, as a young student potential officer. And when I was at Sandhurst, I say hurt my back, but it's, um, people always say you're invalided out. I, they kind of have a kind of image of me sort of being helicoptered off a battlefield or, you know, stretched off somewhere. And it, it wasn't at all. I had an ingrowing hair at the base of my spine, which became septic and it had to be operated on. It's called a pilonidal sinus. And it's quite a complex operation because you have to stay on bed rest for such a long time. And actually what happened was it then recurred. So I had to have the same operation on scar tissue, which took longer to heal. About 18 months went by. And I, you know, you're, you're always much more impatient when you're younger. And I just wanted to get on with life and living. And I thought, well, you know, my contemporaries have now moved up the ladder and I'm, I'm still stuck here. And so I, in the end, was invalided out. The army invalided me out and I went to drama school and I went to the Guild Hall and I studied for another three years to become a professional actor uh, up and down the country in rep theatre for I think three or four years before I got a, a chance to audition at the National Theatre uh, and uh, yeah so that's 
that's my kind of very brief uh, military career, if you like. Have you seen overlaps between being a soldier and being an actor? I think you said when you, you talked about the combined cadet force moment where you, you sort of you put on a uniform and you, um, you, you almost play a role. Are there connections? Mm -hmm. People always said, oh, it's so different becoming an actor from being a soldier. And actually, I, I used to not agree with that. I think there's lots of overlaps. You know, when you are a soldier, particularly an officer, you're putting on this uniform, a costume, and you're taking up a role, uh, the role of leader with a group of people. And that does require a certain element of performance. Obviously, it's, it's you. You have to find the authentic you to do that. But it is, there is a sense of everyone's looking at you to make the decisions and how you perform that. So I think there are lots of ways they do like the, the discipline that's needed, the routine, the rehearsal, all of those things, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, a synergy. And I suppose the work that I've been doing more recently with the, the Soldiers Arts Academy and working with veterans is that, yes, there's a, there's a huge overlap and there's a familiarity there that the, the veterans kind of long for, that they get into very quickly. Uh, so, yeah, and actually at school, the only two things I was in, any good at were the CCF, because I think I used to enjoy running around, dressing up and shouting at people, and the school play, which seemed very similar. You know, you put on this costume and you shout at people. So, uh, you know, it seemed like a no-brainer to, to go from the army to, to acting. Yes, I think uh, you're underselling your talents there somewhat, but um, as well as acting, you quite early on started writing as well, is that right? Yes, I was with the company at the National Theatre and they have a studio space down by the Old Vic in the Cut in Waterloo. And everyone in the company at the time, I mean, we're going you know, back into the mid 90s, is, was back then encouraged to go and do things at the studio, classes, workshops. And I was sitting around one lunchtime having a coffee and the wonderful Peter Gill director who, who ran the space, I was in conversation with him and he asked me about, you know, tell me about you. And so I sort of launched into some of my army exploits and the military hospital. And he said, oh, I, you know, I've seen that as a play. And I laughed and he went, no, 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 seriously. I, you know, I think there's a play there. Why don't you write a scene and we can, we can work on it. And that's what I did. I, I went home and I started writing and I realized how cathartic it was to actually had all this stuff inside of me that I wanted to get out. And having the opportunity to do that in in a way with a, with really good people was was extraordinary, um, therapeutic, cathartic. My play that came out of that, Our Boys, is set in the military hospital at Woolwich, and the characters in the play are either amalgamations of people that I met, or they are absolutely directly based on people that I came across. One of which was uh, a guy who'd been blown up in the Hyde Park bomb. He'd been in for over a year. And on the surface of it seemed okay. You know, you kind of wonder why he was still there. His physical injuries had been kind of healed, but obviously over time and being near him, you, you, I, as a young man, had no experience of what he'd been through, but I witnessed someone who was in crisis, who was having issues with his mental health. And it was very influential on me. It had a huge impression and I wanted to write about it. I wanted to write about him and uh, another guy, Keith, an Irish ranger who was on the other side of me in the mm -hmm. bay. And they were like mum and dad, actually, in, in this bay. So the, the play that came out of that, Our Boys, was a huge learning curve for me, but it also opened a lot of doors. And, you know, suddenly it was produced and it started winning awards and, you know, suddenly becoming an award-winning playwright. And it hadn't, that really hadn't been on my agenda. I was looking for my next acting job and suddenly this other opportunity opened up and, you know, you're getting commissioned by the National Theatre to write your next play and having an opportunity to work in the studio on writing attachments. So suddenly I've got a desk and a phone and uh, an ID badge when I could go into any of the shows and you suddenly you're validated in a way. So, yeah, that took me took my career in a different direction really. But it was as a result of the revival of Our Boys when I, direct, I got the chance to direct it at the Dam, Don Mar Warehouse, that um, the casting director of, us, of the series Soldier Soldier saw the show, hadn't realized that as an actor, this, this autobiographical uh, story, um, you know, remember talking to me and saying, I didn't know, you'd, you know, you'd been in the army. And, Anyway, so I was asked to audition for the role of the platoon sergeant in Soldier Soldier, and I got the part. So suddenly I'm playing a soldier 
having thought I was going to be one, I'm actually putting on the costume and learning the lines and running around with a gun and someone shouting action and cut. Uh, I mean, it, it was it was strange getting my head around all of that. I mean, it was it was wonderful, but it was strange. And of course, I was the nerdy, geeky, annoying actor who would be telling the other actors that you wouldn't wear your beret like that or you wouldn't hold your weapon. And they say, oh, shut up, that's not your job. But it used to irritate me when it wasn't, it wasn't accurate, you know. We had a military advisor, of course, who was going around doing the same thing. But yes, two, two years of playing Sergeant Chris McLeod, playing a, a role of authority, uh, the, the sergeant, was a, was a wonderful time, wonderful learning experience, uh, learning how the camera works, how to tell stories visually on film and having that opportunity really to sort of relive or go through a kind of military alter ego, if you like. So one thing really led to another, as you say, everything fell into place quite nicely, you know, with all the different parts of, of your career and your career development really forming a yeah. very interesting sort of coherent whole. I wonder, Johnny, whether we could uh, we could stick with our boys for just a moment, just in case uh, not all of our listeners are familiar with it. So you were saying that PTSD was an important part of your work already there, already in this, uh, in, in the play. So I'm wondering, how did you deal with this? What's happening in the play? How did you sort of use the play to, to talk about all of these experiences? But also how common was it at that point to address these issues? Yeah, I'll answer that all backwards, really. Very rare. No one, it wasn't framed as PTSD. You know, it wasn't really labeled in the same way. I mean, we, we had shell shock and it was labeled in slightly different ways. It was still a kind of bit of a dirty word. No one really wanted to to really go there. Anyone who went for any psycho psychoanalysis was, you know, going to see the psycho boys. It wasn't a thing. And as a young man myself, I had no experience of of seeing this in action and what what trauma does to people, you know, in the middle of the night uh, when you're sharing a, a ward, a bay. And I found that frankly terrifying. But, you know, really scary as a young man, no, you know, no experience. The play itself, uh, as I said, is very autobiographical. It's set in a bay and the play starts actually with the two characters of Joe and Keith. So the, the guy blown up in the high pot bomb and this Keith, the Irish ranger, having a conversation about me because Joe had been asked by the sister whether it was okay to put me in the bay with them. They'd been there that long, they were part of the furniture. So the sister didn't want to do anything to disrupt them. And Joe didn't want to rock the boat because he was bringing in a suitcase of beers. Uh, totally verboten, but that's what they were doing because they were getting ready to play a game called Beer Hunter, which is the uh, a reenactment of the Russian roulette scene from The Deer Hunter, which I'll come on to in a little while. But The conversation basically between Keith and Joe was a row because Keith really didn't want me in the bay. They didn't want an officer anywhere near them because that represented authority that I would be telling them to, to do stuff, which is absolutely not the case, but that was their assumption. Uh, and Joe, who seemed to have the run of the place, he treated the place like a hotel. He was out every night. He'd get his sort of chip signed by his sister and he'd be off at the pub. I mean, It was bizarre. I couldn't work out why he was still there. Anyway, Keith loses the argument and obviously I'm I'm going to be coming into the bay. So he sticks his headphones on really loud. He starts playing a game of chess on his own. Uh, and in I kind of, I walk like John Wayne. I'm waddling in because, you know, my I've got these stitches in, in, in my bum cheeks, basically. It's really uncomfortable. And this guy, Joe, introduces himself as Joe uh, and he then introduces... Uh, the other guy uh, with the loud headphones as Wank. Uh, and I look at him going, and you're, no, 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 it's an, it's a na he's named after Hank Wankford, I think, you know, the country and Western, you know. And, you know, soldiers have the most ridiculous nickname. So I thought, oh, you know, I didn't think much of it, but I just thought, okay, he's, he's called Wank. And, and then he said, the reason why his music's so loud is because he's deaf, perforated hearing from being on the ranges. So I just assumed that's, yeah, yeah, okay, he's, he's obviously deaf. And then Joe leaves the bay to get his chip signed and leaves me with this guy, Keith, who then takes his headphones off. I think I dropped something. I tried my help button and it wouldn't work. Uh, so I immediately say, um, excuse me, wank, could you press your help button, please? And he looks at me like I've, you know, with th thunder in his eyes. And I think, oh, he's deaf, so I'll be even louder. So I'm shouting, wank, wank. He then gets up and marches out of the bay and says, that's it, I'm not having you in the bay. Now that actually happened. 
Uh, and that's how the play starts. They, they, they end up playing this beer hunter game where, you know, they put the bandanas on and they've got the beers and they make, they're making sure no one's coming into the bay. And, you know, one of them is the MC and he stands in the middle and six cans on the tray. You know, there's two of the guys are facing each other. They do the whole thing of, I love you, Mikey. I love you. One of the cans gets fizzed up. It gets put back on the, on the tray. The guy's eyes are covered. The tray gets spun round, so no one knows where the fizzed up can is. And then, you know, it's a whole point of you pick up the can is, it, and if you open it, is it going to fizz against your head? In which case you're out, you've lost. I just found it extraordinary. This real anti-war film was so celebrated. It was iconic to them. I thought, God, how ironic is that? Mm-hmm. Anyway, so in the play, what happens is uh, that it, it causes an accident and Keith ends up um, having to have another operation on his leg and there's a big inquiry as to why there were beers involved and there's a sort of betrayal of the group and one of them has 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 betrayed them and obviously the finger points to me as the as the officer cadet uh, and of course it isn't me I'm the obvious suspect but it isn't me it's, it's one of them and it's a, it, it leads to a, a PTSD incident by Joe who to punish the the one the guy who's actually done it he he tries to cut his toes off uh, he's lost some of his toes because of frostbite. And he said, well, your punishment is you're going to lose the rest of the toes because he knows that means he'd never be allowed back in, in the military. But and when it comes down to it, he can't do it. So he, he hits his own wall, if you like. And there's a, there's a stage direction at that moment. It's incredibly dramatic because it's, it's very funny to play, but it then gets darker and darker. But right at the end, when he tries to cut these toes off, he can't do it. And the stage direction is he howls like an animal, a wounded animal, just hearing the actor do that it's like putting a knife through the audience and it used to get me every time uh, and then the play finishes off with my character coming back so it's the kind of my condition recurred and I had to go back in and have the operation again and actually um, some of them were still there and this was you know sort of four or five months later uh, and so there's that sense of returning to the was like the scene of a crime or I'd moved on but they hadn't and I suppose it, the, it is about trauma. It's about giving your life for your country, uh, service, duty, and I suppose being let down by that. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to honour them and that kind of impact that I had on my life. That's the kind of broad uh, scope of the of the play. So, so Johnny, um, you you mentioned the deer hunter already. And that kind of makes me wonder about other influences on play. Obviously, you said it's very autobiographical, but at the same time, we are all influenced by the things we read and 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 see, and 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 the, and the play sort of stands in the tradition of people writing about the injuries that war causes. I'm, I'm thinking mm-hmm. in particular of Hemingway, who you know, when, whenever he writes about wars in his novels, it's always somebody who has some sort of trauma. It could be physical, can be emotional, psychological. Most often, it's both. So where, did you sort of, were, were there other influences uh, as you were kind of writing about this? And did you see yourself in a, in a tradition there? Yes, I did. It's interesting you asked that. There's, there's a playwright called James McClure, an American playwright who wrote a play called Private Wars. Mm-hmm. And when I'd been at university uh, in 19, we're going way back now, 1984, the, the National Student Drama Festival was at Bretton Hall in Wakefield. And production of private wars was done by the students of guild hall and as soon as i saw it, i thought i've got to go there you know that that's obviously the place to go it was three students had put this show together off their own bat and it was all about three korean war um veterans in a military hospital uh, a veterans hospital coming to terms with their own physical and mental uh, traumas so that was that was very much in my mind when i was writing our boys was particularly that play because the effect that it had on me when I when I saw it at university was was huge. It's a wonderful play, wonderful play. You mentioned Johnny that PTSD wasn't something that was much talked about, let alone seen, and and yet you you were also writing up to a point in a tradition of trauma literature, almost um, exploring trauma through drama and through literature. So I suppose that takes me on to a question that maybe brings us back to Soldier Soldier. Just generally, when you were when you were playing that role, when you were playing Sergeant Chris McLeod in Soldier Soldier, what kind of story did it tell about the military and about war more generally? 
And how does that fit, do you think, in the sort of the wider tradition that was circulating at the time about what we saw dramatised of the military and of war on stage and, and on screen? I got frustrated at times because it, it did feel very soap opera, you know, the storylines of families, wives, partners. And, I, and, that, and you know, in Lucy Gannon's original idea for the series was it was to be about the, the wives and the partners as much as it was the, the, the guy mm-hmm. serving. But, it, you know, we, we had tumble down about Robert Lawrence, who was wounded in the Falklands. There were more kind of hard hitting things around. There's a wonderful uh, film called Contact, which is all about, I don't know if you know it, but it's all about the, a kind of border patrol in Northern Ireland. The whole thing leads to this moment where is this foot patrol gets to a parked car, quite suspicious because it's in the middle of nowhere. That awful moment where one of them has to go and check it out. You know, your heart's in your mouth because you think it's going to it's going to blow up, it's blow, it's a car bomb, it's a car bomb, and they get to it. One of them does it, and few, and as they're walking away, it blows up. There's very little dialogue in it. it it's very, it feels like a, a documentary, but it is drama, and it's an incredibly powerful. And uh, so there were there were much more real things happening. The thing about soldier soldiers is it, it sort of popularized. I, it wasn't a bad thing, I have to say. And of course, you'd, you'd meet, uh, I'd meet soldiers or veterans. I never watched it, never watched it. Uh, and uh, then they say, that bit when you did, uh, you know, and you'd think, uh, you probably did watch it there. But they, they, they'd love to sort of slag it off or say, no, it's not like that. And, uh, uh, and that's fine. I mean, but it was what it was. It was sort of, it, it, was, a, it was to reach a broad audience. And when you reach a broad audience, you, you do have to make, make compromises. But I think the early series of that, the first couple of series of that were actually, and they were written by Lucy Gannon herself, I think they were really good. They had a lot of value to them in terms of, not necessarily expose, but but having some sense of that's what it's like, being particularly being a wife or a partner in, in that situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, by the time I joined the series in series five and six, it had, it had yeah, there was still lots to admire, but it had become quite soapy at that stage. I think. I think it's interesting that perhaps, would you say that with your own writing, one of the things you were wanting to do was plug some gaps in the representation of soldiering, of the military, focusing in on aspects less often seen perhaps on screen. You know, it's if you think about a dramatisation of the military, you wouldn't imagine a, as a first port of call that you'd set it in a in a military hospital, for example, and that it that it would be, you know, be about sort of people talking, messing around, joking around and so on. So was your writing, do you think, trying consciously to plug some gaps in the representation of the life of the soldier or the um the the military world more generally? Um, or were you channeling these sort of autobiographic experiences? It was much more the latter at the time as a young man, having had those conversations at the National Theatre Studio with Peter Gill. You know, it was, I was stumbling through this. There, there wasn't really a, a, a rhyme and reason to it. it. It was anecdotal. It was, as I said, it was looking back, I realised how cathartic it was. And I had a lot of this stuff you know, in me, and not just from the military hospital, but also from right through school and university when I'd been away with my regiment doing stuff. There was a lot of stuff in me that I needed to get out. So the, you know, the setting of the military hospital and giving it that context, um, that all worked very well. But you're quite right. The producer would say, you know, no one wants to go and see a play about soldiers in a military hospital. That's, That's deadly. You know, we can't sell tickets on that. You know, give me sex, give me, give me, give me topless soldiers and I can do something with it. And so it was like, oh no. So it was always a challenge, you know, how do you make this uh, commercial but still retain its, its heart? And as you say, you did, you didn't just sell tickets, you know, it, it actually, it, it won awards, it, it was premiered in 1993, then it taken again and revived 1995, and then again in 2012. So there's something that people really want to see about it. And as you say, you know, it's this mix of entertaining and authentic. You, what is the message that you want people to take away from our boys? I've always been ambivalent about the military. Whatever your political opinion is about war com- conflict, the people that have to go and do that, you know, they're not making those decisions. They're just, they are literally following orders. They're doing the bidding of a government. And I think you have to separate the two. The army is a fantastic place, believe it or not. And people are going, what are you talking about? If you don't, if you don't know what to do with your life and you're a young person, 
And given that a lot of the recruiting comes from very socially deprived areas where, you, you know, the choices are very limited, you know, it's very difficult to get out of that. Or you have the opportunity to join up in some form to get an education, all of that, all of those kind of things. If you don't know what to do with your life, actually, there's a lot to be said for that. And I know people go, oh, yeah, but what about all the kind of discipline and stuff? Yeah, I think actually sometimes it's, you know, that self, the understanding of self-discipline and testing yourself and resilience and trying to work out what you want to do with your life I think it is a, an opportunity to explore and I wouldn't shut the door and go I'd never join the military at the same time we owe a duty to these people who do decide to join up and I don't think we honor that and I don't think we have ever really veterans you know when our boys was first on I did some research and it was something like 30 percent of the homeless were ex-military 30 mm-hmm. percent and you know for whatever reason and that hasn't really declined that much and the fact that without being patronizing but most of the folks that I've come across in the military are very proud and they get on with the job get your hat down and do it do the job and they don't want charity and they don't you know someone needs it more than I do uh, is very common so they don't know how to ask for help um, I don't want charity and there are too many hoops to go through so I think we just need to honour and look after warriors and there's a sort of an assumption or expectation or they just come back and they'll fit in and get on with that and you will change if you have had to put yourself in a situation where you have to learn to be a, a warrior the training to do that uh, does something to you which alters you and I I really believe that as much time needs to be spent on making sure soldiers, sailors, airmen, anyone who's trained to fight has as much time to unlearn that as they do to learn it. It's pretty derisory the amount of time that is spent de- you know decompressing from the military into civilian life. Yeah going back to your question Yes, uh, it, it's honouring warriors and uh, and that we have a duty of care as a society to do that. And um, I don't want to hit people over the head with that. I want to tell stories where you go, shouldn't we be looking after these people a bit better? That it's just there. It's in the fabric of the of the play, of the writing of the film of, or, or whatever. It's very interesting to hear you talk. Obviously, a lot of your writing is autobiographical, but clearly an awful lot of it is powered by this interest, this concern of yours, that society doesn't look after honour serving soldiers as well as it should, or even understand them. So it's not a surprise actually to find that most of your writing focuses on that sort of that boundary, that blurred boundary between being in the military and being out of it, being a serving soldier. So you're not, you know, you're not, you're not showing people actually deployed on, you know, on deployment in the thick of the action. Um, you're also not showing pure civilians, you're showing these people who are sort of caught in this kind of almost this no man's land sometimes, whether it's in a military hospital or in the wider veteran experience. Perhaps mm-hmm. this is a good moment to ask you just to talk a little bit about what inspired you to write Soldier On? In the beginning, it was uh, a commission. It started life, I was commissioned to write a play with the wider military community of Plymouth. And I spent a summer, summer of 2015, I think it was, down in Plymouth. And I was involved uh, with a director and a company of wives and partners and veterans. And we did lots of workshops and I had lots of conversations, uh, discussions. Uh, and then I went away and I wrote, and in the end, actually what they performed, uh, it was a play called Boots at the Door. And in the end, I think a lot of it was devised and they used some of my writing, but uh, the director kind of crafted a play. When I came back to London, I suppose the overwhelming feeling that I took from that experience I wanted to write the play about the making of the play, if you like, in the tradition of Our Country's Good, a wonderful play by Timberlake Wurtenbaker. In my work, as, as Nicholas was saying, you know, what, what other influences, you know, like Private Wars, I suppose for me, music is incredibly important. I always have a sort of a palette of music in my head when I'm writing, but also a palette of plays or a palette of other theatrical experiences that I've seen or or admired. And, you know, uh, our country's good is right up there. 
another one is The Pitman Painters by Lee Hall. Again, a wonderful, wonderful play. So I had these sort of benchmarks in my head about someone coming in to, to, to teach or to help people discover something about themselves. You know, I'd been through this. It felt when I was in Plymouth, I felt like I was in the movie of, and when I went to see it, you know, months later, they'd been rehearsing and I went to see it. It was very moving to see, you know, a group of people come together and using all the skills that the military do, you know, the, the drilling of learning of the lines and the coming together of, of a production. And I realized that's what I wanted to write about was, was that, that's what, that's what moved me. And so I went back to London and I wrote what became the, the kind of the bare bones of Soldier On, which is about a character called Harry, who is essentially me going to make a play with a group of people it follows quite a, I suppose, a well-worn path. So uh, this guy arrives, he's, he's second in command or the person looking after him from the British Legion is Len and Len thinks it's all a complete waste of time. So he's not really that committed to it. In fact, he's really irritated by Harry and we go through a kind of rehearsal, uh, we audition process. So we meet our characters through their auditions, if you like, a little bit like the full Monty. Uh, and then um, we see them kind of talking about their experiences and they start improvising there's a there's a there's a key moment in the play where the wives where they're all talking and uh, Harry asks what it's like for the women for the wives left behind the partners and the guys start you know well you know we're the ones doing the hard work we you know they're, they're, they're the ones you know waiting and then and then the women actually say how difficult it is for them having to Having to keep it all together, you know, you know what happens when your your child's sick, stress of it all, and carrying all of that. Um, and one of the the women, the, they we, the Harry says, well, he sets up an, uh, an improvisation. He said, well, let's improvise the scene. It's kitchen, it's the morning, it's kitchen. You're getting the kids to school, uh, go. And she starts uh, trying to give them breakfast, and the kids are uh, messing around, and some of the guys watching it are you know, taking the mic and it suddenly becomes incredibly real for her to the point where she loses it. Uh, and there's a sort of moment of, oh God, what was that about? And then she bursts into tears and says, I didn't know whether to tell him, you know, that our youngest was ill and she's had to go in for an operation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and just that, I didn't know what to do. I, I just didn't know what to do. And it was so moving. Um, and of course, everyone, has had that phone call anyone in the military has had that phone call so it was a pivotal moment in the in the production in the play uh, sort of halfway through the first half with that scene because suddenly you know ha ha very funny you know these characters were meeting and something something very real was put on the stage in front of them and when we first did the scene you know one of the veterans actually had to sort of he couldn't he couldn't be in the room for a long time when we did it because it, was, it stirred up a lot for him but you know what it's almost like the emdr form of therapy the more you do it the more you talk about it the more you're in it the less visceral it becomes the, the, the more you can be outside of the emotion and talk about it rather than it being in the emotion so i think in terms of catharsis for a lot of the veterans involved that's off that's how it's one of the ways it works if you like is that sense of even if it's not your story, you have an attachment to the story, you projecting onto the story, your your own version of it, if you like. Uh, and um, that's always been incredibly powerful. So that's how I came to the writing of Soldier On, but I had this play with 17 characters in it. And I thought, well, you know, that's gonna stay in the drawer because, you know, unless it's the National Theatre come calling, no one's ever gonna do that. And then it was uh, what a Christmas 2017, I think. Um, I got a phone call from Amanda Faber, who had started the Soldiers Arts Academy. I'd done some workshops with a company called the Combat Veteran Players. I'd been wanting to write a play about the Poppy Factory in Richmond. I used to drive past it on my motorbike. And I was just thinking, what goes on in there? And one afternoon I just stopped and I went in and the guy on the desk, he said, can I help you? Um, when I said who I was, uh, he looked at me and went, did you write Our Boys? And I thought, gosh, uh, I wasn't expecting that. And he went, oh, I love that play. Yeah, come on in. And it was this guy, Sean, who was this member of the Combat Veteran Players, who they, they were using Shakespeare. 
to help them, you know, as a community and to process stuff. So I went and did some workshops with the combat veteran players. And that's what became the Soldiers Arts Academy. And actually Sean had had a conversation with Amanda about the fact that I'd written this play and could Amanda read it. Mm. And within, you know, she rang me and said, I, I want to produce this. And I said, well, I hope you've got deep pockets because it's going to cost quite a lot of money. And th that was the start of, of Soldier On. So, so Johnny, just to clarify, um, all, all the people acting in the play, they're all ex-soldiers, they're all veterans. I, through working with veterans, what I realized is that you need to have a benchmark of what good looks like on a stage. And that's not to be patronizing or derogatory to, to veterans, but when you've got professional actors around, it gives you a benchmark of what good looks yeah. like. So I wanted to make sure that in the Soldiers Arts Academy, we have a, a kind of fairly... It's not exact, but we try to go for about 50-50% in terms of professional actors and 50% veterans. And so there's a lot of learning, a lot of mentoring goes on on both on both sides of that. And one of the biggest compliments from when we did do Soldier On was the audiences didn't, they would often say at the end, I didn't know who were the actors and who were the veterans. And for me, that's the biggest compliment of the lot, really. I think it's important if, if you want to do stuff with veterans. I mean, I mean, yes, there's a sort of the veteran community in doing that. But in terms of moving it forward, I, I think it's very valuable having professional actors around because, you know, the conversations that then occur about, well, how do you get an agent? And, you know, could you go through this with me? And, oh, God, you know, and, and actually sometimes giving the veterans the courage to explore emotion the scene with the wife breaking down in this improvisation scene, that was played by uh, an actress. And when we first did it, her bravery to actually go there and break down um, was incredible. And I'm not, I'm not saying if I cast a veteran, they wouldn't have done it, but it, the, the immediate access to emotion was a license for the veterans to it's okay. You know, this is what we do to explore that. Uh, and, and, there are lots of benefits to that, I think. Mm. So I don't know if that's a that's a USP to the Soldiers Arts Academy, but for me, it's important that you bring these communities together and that there's there's learning on both sides. That really strikes me as a hallmark of you know all the work you're doing, the way in which you, you blur the boundaries between stage and, and reality, but you need both elements in there for yeah. it to work. And that, that really starts with your own play, which draws a lot on your own experiences, but it's a play and, and continues. And it takes us right back to what you were saying this importance of unlearning the things that, that you've learned of you know giving the veterans an opportunity to work through their experiences and you're using the theater and this kind of theater mm. which is so closely linked with with the reality of you know what, what's been happening what to achieve exactly this of course you need both elements for this to achieve the same uh, you already mentioned the soldiers arts academy uh, and also uh, already hinting at that there's more going on than just the place, just the staging of the place. Can you tell us a bit more about the kind of work you're doing with the veterans at the Soldiers Arts Academy? A plug for the Soldiers Arts Academy. We have a, a website, uh, soldiersartsacademy.org. It's open to anyone, particularly veterans, also serving, also professional actors. Uh, it's, it's a platform to explore being creative. It's become more than that in a way because some of our veterans are now working professionally uh, as actors or film crew. We've got... Uh, a wonderful girl Sophie who did costumes on Soldier On and now she's working with a camera crew on The Witcher for Netflix. So we're providing up an opportunity particularly for veterans to engage with a transformation into careers in the performing arts. I mean if you're a if you're a logistics NCO if you've been in the Royal Corps of Transport you're ideally placed to to run a film set. I don't know how many military, ex-military would necessarily make that connection. Yes, we want to explore stories and being creative, but it's not just about, it's about that. It's just saying that we're, we are a platform to engage with being creative and how about a career in that? Or maybe we can hook you up with um, someone who does know about that. So whether it's filmmaking, whether it's dance. At the moment in lockdown, we've been running workshops every day there's something for everyone. So there's one of the veterans, Tom, leads, he's an ex-Marine. He leads a, a wonderful Get Fit class. And then we've dance classes going on. We've got portrait painting. We've got photography. We've got, um, I've been leading a playwriting um, workshop. I'm developing my new play with Soldiers Arts Academy this way. So yes, there's a therapeutic 
and community aspect to the Soldiers Arts Academy, but it also has this other function that to give people a start or an opportunity to, to perhaps think of careers. So yeah, we're trying to sort of stay open and available as much as possible. I mean, you know, it's an open door. There's no, you don't go on waiting lists or anything. All our stuff is is open. So um, sometimes a lot of these things, you've got to go on a waiting list or get invited to do this and that. And I think it's trying to take as many of those things out so it's as easy as possible to to be part of. And so in a way, the Soldiers Arts Academy is doing one of the things that you want your plays to to encourage everyone to do you said talking about you know if, if there was a message coming out of our boys it would be that we need to honor veterans that, that society has a duty to take care to understand and that the soldiers arts academy is doing this in really broad ways in very practical ways but also in terms as you say of providing community and again linking up so many different strands of your career so far where you've worked with these communities in in other in other forms um, just to, to focus in on the, the idea of therapy a little bit more, you've said a few times that you want your plays to be entertaining, but also authentic. And I think you, you've said about Soldier On that you wanted to write a play about PTSD that was funny, that wasn't yep. patronising or worthy, but that tells it like it is. And I was just yep. wondering how you managed to combine those things, how you managed to combine the entertaining with that sense of authenticity and that sense that the play, you are helping people explore these emotional challenges which you've talked about. I didn't want to write something that was verbatim. Uh, I know verbatim has its place, but I wanted to write a story. I wanted to write a narrative that came from fiction, a sort of what if. You know, my, my experience of going to the theatre is I don't have a long attention span. I'm not an intellectual. Things need to hit me here and I need to be taken on a journey. I want to learn something, but I don't necessarily want the learning to be told what the learning is. I, I want to experience something. So I, I write as I would want to see something. Everything I do, I try and do from the heart. It's about an emotional connection with the material whatever whatever that is and how things evolve the alchemy of that excites me and you know I might go in thinking it's one thing and then actually through being in it and doing it you realize it's is it something else but you don't know that at the beginning so it's it's being uncomfortable in the fog of creativity uh, that really interests me so as I say to the guys you know you things don't come out fully formed you, you Johnny, can I ask about a point that you were making, um, how important it is that it is fictional. Um, so it's, it's, it's about real experiences, but there's also this creative process. It's, it's you know, your language, you want to write this thing. And um, obviously we, we are quite interested in, in the ways in which language helps us process ideas, um, experiences. And uh, one, one of the things I'm wondering is whether fictional element is, is actually the element that allows your plays to be so realistic, because a lot of the, the experiences that people go through are very personal experiences. And often the key is to give people a language they can use in which they can find themselves, in, in which they can express themselves. But there's also a language that's then shared by the people who are watching the, the, the play. So, you know, you, the fictional element gives them sort of a, a neutral ground to talk about what happened to them, but also to connect to people who are, who are watching the, and the play and who don't have that experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes you can get trapped by verbatim because there's always that sense of, well, it didn't happen, so you can't put it in. Oh, well, okay. But it'd be more interesting if we did that rather than that. Yeah, but that didn't happen. And they say, you know, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. You know, sometimes you have to, to do what if, or you have to bend it. Mm -hmm. And of course that didn't happen. But actually the more interesting version for our story is this. I know verbatim has its place, the kind of documentary style. But for me personally in the creative process, as exactly as you've said, what I find is as if it's got this, if it's got the smell of authenticity, it does allow people to go what if and project their own stories, if you like, onto the narrative. But I think one of the most important things is if you accept that as a premise, that the story has to then come out of what I call archetypes. It has to come out of, you know, what Joseph Campbell was saying about, you know, all societies have the same characters, essentially. The warrior, the healer, the lover, the politician. And when you have the same characters, the same narratives tend to evolve. 
So if you appreciate that, then the stories that I try to create, I suppose I'm aspiring to archetypal, not stereotypal, but archetypal, because then people attach their own experience onto that narrative and they get hooked into it in a way which is more compelling. Uh, and it also gives you more license, if you like, with, with, with the story when you do that. I'm not leading with that, but I know that, that that's the kind of subtext, you know. But I, and I, exactly as you say, I think it releases the story in a way and allows people to attach themselves in, in, in a way. It's interesting. It, the previous episode was an interview with Harry Parker, author of Anatomy of a Soldier, and in some ways a very autobiographical account, but also incredibly fictional in some ways too and it's this sort of space between the real the authentic and the fictional and the creative that gives stories power and gives stories a a sort of a universality and the ability for those taking part in them or those simply listening to them to see through to visualize to process their own experiences yeah lovely dear harry who did the he did the image from my play soldier on the first image which was a fist holding a a, a bunch of dog tags you talked about archetypes I think you've got some new writing under underway which again is focused on healing and and trauma but based around the story of Jason and the Argonauts can you tell us a bit about that yes I can and when I was a, a kid growing up I remember the first time I saw Jason and the Argonauts in the Hollywood version uh by Ray Harryhausen and it had a profound impact on me, I think. It, you know, the monsters that moved and, and, and the whole thing, the skeleton warriors. And that's always sort of been somewhere in, in my head. And uh, of course, there's the Odyssey, uh, the Iliad. There's, you know, there's so much wonderful storytelling telling in that. And then in the research of Soldier On, the whole thing about the fact that Greeks processed PTSD by after a battle they would light a big fire and they would stand around and they would they would tell the story of the battle they would they would narrate and this is one of the reasons why we know so much about military history is the fact that they had these cathartic experiences where as someone explained to me with PTSD not really know much about it but they said that the brain can't uh, open a file for trauma it can't file it away so when we go to sleep and we dream, we process our experiences and it's like we open up a filing cabinet in the brain and we store that file in that, we close it and we store that one. But with trauma, there is no file, which is why you can't, with the sort of hypervigilance and you can't, you can't let it go and things trigger it very quickly because you haven't been able to park it anywhere. But when you open up a file and this shared file, by talking about it, by sharing this experience, somehow what you're doing is creating the shared experience of this and somehow the validating of this in itself is a way of processing, of opening up the file. And all these things I sort of was reading about, I think, oh, wow, okay, that really makes sense. And then I I read Bessel van der Kolk's book, you know, The Body Keeps the Score. And someone who I admire very much came to see Soldier On and she said to me, have you read this book called The Body Keeps a Score by Bessel van der Kolk? And I said, no. And she, she said, I think you should read it. And I sat down to it and he basically goes through all, lots of different therapies and particularly to, to do with PTSD and particularly to do with CI PTSD, combat induced PTSD. And what was so interesting for me was I've been doing this stuff very instinctively with no, nothing other than trust me, I know this works to, to back me up. And I suddenly read a book where the science, the brain science, the neuroscience that Bessel van der Kolk's done is just confirming everything that we knew worked. So it was wonderful to go, yes, yes, here's the book. This, you know, give us money to help us, you know, put on our play. Because, you know, when it's sport, you know, there's personal bests and gold medals and you can, you can judge it. But when it's experiential, how do you, how do you persuade the charities to give you money to, to do a play when you can't show them exactly that you've changed these lives? So suddenly having the, someone who's got a book with this sort of experiential thing and, you know, information like the US military spends over $100 million a year on Prozac, uh, you know, these things that jump out at me and you think, well, if you start doing this kind of stuff, the healing is deeper, it's longer lasting. You know, I'm not saying you're replacing drug therapy, but there's so much stuff that you can do. So I started putting all these, joining all these dots together and Ray Harryhausen and it was kept, kept coming sort of, you know, this experience. And I'm a firm believer that actually sometimes stories call us 
you know, we, 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 if we're open, the story will find us. And then I watched a documentary called The Work, which is all about a, a group of psychologists that go into prisons to help uh, men particularly unlock their frozen emotional, their core. And it's very moving. It's, it's quite hard hitting. So now, again, another piece of the jigsaw. And I thought, I want to write a play about a group of people who've suffered traumas and the group therapy session is led by Harry again, but it's using a group of people who use the story of Jason and the Argonauts to confront their own trauma. So there are bits in the story along the way and one bit of the story will trigger someone's moment for catharsis. So it's using the story of Jason and the Argonauts, but it's the, the therapeutic of telling the story. They've told the story again and again and again because it helps them process their trauma but it's using that greek the ancient greek story uh, as a way to do that and then then i hear that the word jason in greek means healing and it was like oh well there you go there's the title the healing it's a real thread of your work isn't it this sense that um that i think as you said about soldier on yourself once soldier on celebrates the power of the story in the healing process and for us it's really interesting to hear you going right back to ancient greek stories because the visualizing war project obviously started um with a sort of inquiry into ancient storytelling around war and how that has canonized particular ideas about war and conflict and soldiering but also as you say helps communities to come together and to process and to understand and to visualize more collectively but to visualize in quite active ways where you're not just looking on but you're sharing and uh, um, it, it really goes back to some of the things you were talking about with our boys this idea that we actually all need to come to a better collective understanding mm -hmm. of the military world the civilian world how they come together what each owes to the other it sounds absolutely appropriate that you've come to Jason and the Argonauts um, uh, as your next piece of work. I hope so. And, you know, most people look at the Odyssey or they are there plays of Jason and the Argonauts and then there really aren't. And also, you know, poor Jason, he gets such a bad, he gets such bad treatment in Medea. The, the, you know, that the actually is, you kind of want to see what happened pre-Medea, actually. You want to see the kind of the loving bit where, where we kind of sort of worked before all of that. Lots of things like that that I want that I that I want to do, but I'm, I'm messing around with it as well. It's not, um, it's picking bits out. It, it's because uh, it's a big story. So there's lots of backstory. I mean, the first half of the play is pretty much all the backstory before you get to the, before they even set sail. Um, there's lots to it, but it's 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 cherry picking the bits that are, that kind of give these people who've suffered trauma the, the opportunity to sort of re-experience their own healing, if you like. So there's a, there's another excellent play to look forward to. And I hope so. So, <laughs> so I, I guess, uh, Johnny, before we let you go, are there any particular dates that you would like us and our listeners to put into our diaries? I mean, of course, things are still a bit in flux, but what are the concrete plans for, you know, um, staging plays for, do you have an idea of when the, when the Argonauts might be finished? Just anything that, you know, that belongs into our diaries? Yeah, another fantastic question. Obviously, because of lockdown and where we are at right now, things are still very in flux i've designed the play to be done in either open air or in spaces that aren't theaters uh in fact i think it would work better in so, sort of a space where you could move audiences around and take people on a literally a physical journey to mm -hmm. see this um with that in mind um we are looking at three weeks of performance in 2022 um at the playground theater uh, which is in London, in West London. It's where we we did our London part of Soldier On before we moved it on to the West End. Uh, it's a wonderful space. It's the sort of space where you can literally take all the seating out and it's this sort of big kind of warehousey type environment. So that's from, I think, something like the 17th of May or it's sort of to, to mid end, so basically in a year's time. Uh, for three weeks there but we're also in discussion with um, the Minac down in Cornwall which is that big open air theatre by the sea be lovely to get them involved um, and then we're just we're looking for dates we're looking for theatres to to join in this process 
it feels good to have this kind of concrete perspective. There's something to look forward to, you know, there's yeah. realistic planning going on and that really feels good. Developing it with a cast and so we're, we do our regular kind of Zoom sessions with the Soldiers Arts Academy. So people kind of show up mm. and we read bits and we talk about, you know, how it could work. And then pre-January, um, the Soldiers Arts Academy now have a, a space in London, in Euston. So we'll be having regular sessions to kind of develop it evolve it and then in january we're having a, a week of development at the playground theater and we're hoping that will uh, result on, on the friday in a kind of showing of where we're at get some feedback so those are kind of milestones before may sounds awesome johnny thank you so much for coming to the podcast for sharing your your experiences with the writing theater making theater staging theater for your the, the work with the veterans and especially for a discussion that really prompts us to think again about the role of culture and narrative and arts and humanities as you know, an important contributor to some really quite crucial problems that we're facing and the, the ways in which you know, storytelling and, and theater can help us address those issues. So that was the fascinating aspect of the, uh, of the discussion today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed the, the opportunity to talk to you. It's been great. Yes, thank you, Johnny. As Nicholas said, it's just really fascinating to hear how soldiering and the arts have come together throughout your life and, you know, the work that you're doing actually to kind of strengthen those bonds, get us thinking about how narrative and social issues really come together. So thank you. And thanks to our listeners for joining us again. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation with Jonathan Guy Lewis as much as we have. Do join us next week for another episode. We'll be staying on stage, but we're going to be turning our attention to musical representations of war. We'll be joined by librettist Susan Verby and composer Kirstine Volnus to talk about the opera that they've created together called Letters You Will Not Get, Women's Voices from the Great War. So we'll be diving back in time revisiting that very familiar conflict but seeing how their storytelling gets us to look at it in a new light so do join us again then for what promises to be another fascinating discussion and if you would like to support our project please share and subscribe to the show on apple Podcasts, spotify or whatever platform you use so you don't miss an episode and please do leave us a rating and review on apple Podcasts because that really helps people find the show if you would like to join us and the conversation further you can follow us on social media just search for visualizing war or get in touch directly with us by emailing at viswar at st andrews.ac.uk our theme music was composed by jonathan young and the show was mixed by zofia gertin thank you for listening <laughs>